Hogwarts Legacy is huge and it's nice to get lost in it, but there were a few mistakes that I wish I avoided along the way to make things much easier. We're also going to go over more things that the game doesn't tell you, so let's jump right in. Now on your first walk around Hogwarts, you'll probably notice quite a few of these doors that appear locked at first. And that's because to open them you need Aloha Mora, which is the unlocking charm. And to get that charm you need to complete the mission called the Caretaker's Luna Lament that you do for Gladwin Moon. And this is going to unlock the level 1 of Aloha Mora that will let you unlock level 1 locks. But there's actually a level 2 and then 3 that you can get if you find and bring back to Gladwin 9 and then 13 more demigai statues that he asks you to bring him. So for the first 9, the fastest route that I found is to just hit the small hamlets around the map during the night time. If you look at the map summary, each one of these holds one demigai statue that's usually found in the houses that are already opened by default. The best part is that your character will also say it out loud if you're close to one of these so it's much easier to find them. The castle alone also has about 10 of these statues scattered around but even if you get the level 2 one it should be enough until the end game. By the way if you want to more quickly complete the Aloha Mora mini game, I found the easiest route is to just quickly spin the outer ring until eventually the small mechanism on the bottom right starts moving and shines with the green light. And from that point on you can fine tune it and start spinning the middle section until the mechanism inside of it is going to start moving as well. If you fine tune both of these once you found the spot, this was in my case the easiest route to just solve them quickly but let me know down below if you have any other trick. At number 2, if you explore the castle enough, you might have noticed at some point some of these door puzzles with the 10 strange symbols on the archways as well as the two interactable sigils on the walls next to them. Well, this is basically a very easy math problem that you have to solve where each of the 10 symbols corresponds to a specific number. The only problem is that at first you don't know which sigil corresponds to each number. For that, you will need one of these study guide pages, which you can find pretty easily early on. So to do so, you need to head over to the library annex in the castle and start right here from the central hall waypoint. You can start from the statue right here with the mermaids and then simply head up two stories up these stairs until you reach this upper level. Once here, take it to the left side, just go up one level and take it to this floor on the round staircase until you reach this location with the astronomy class waypoint. Once you're here, head over to the right side and take up the path with the wooden floors until you reach this middle section. Here you will find another puzzle in the back, a writing board and a chest that will contain the study guide page with all of the numbers and the corresponding symbols. So now that you know what the missing numbers are, it's just a matter of simple addition where the smaller circles, if you add them up, will give you the big number in the center and yeah that's basically it you go inside take the loot and there's quite a bit of it actually items as well as spellcraft for your room of requirement at number three one mistake i was guilty of was not paying enough attention to the challenge menus early on not only did avalanche made possibly the best challenge tracking system in any game ever but every single one of them provides something useful and cool as a reward so every single puzzle you complete, enemy defeated around the map, side quests, even flying with your broom through some of these balloons you find randomly out in the wild will count towards a challenge track that usually rewards you with something very useful. In many cases this means extra cosmetics like armors, headwear, even new brooms with many of them also looking very unique. I especially recommend the exploration challenges for many of them, especially the popping balloons part which gives you some really interesting and free brooms. Or the Merlin trials and the ancient magic spots that we talked about previously that will further increase the ultimate meters you have as well as your inventory size. At number 4 you might have already played your first round of Summoner's Court and while it's a simple and fun game you can easily lose a match if your pool game isn't good enough. So an easy way to always score a max of 50 points, which is basically the last row with the blue color at the end, is by just following this very simple trick. So when you use Akio on your ball, simply hold the button until your ball reaches around the middle area of the platform at the orange 20 points mark. 
I usually let the button go right as the ball reaches the middle section of the orange part, which ensures it always reaches at the max point and doesn't fall over the side or lose all of the points by falling over the edge. Another thing I really like doing is to just mess with my opponents and have their own balls thrown outside of the platform by bumping my own into theirs. So the balls closest to the edge or even the ones on the final 50 points that belong to your opponent, the easiest way to take down is to just do this, follow the exact same route as previously, but instead of holding until the orange section, hold the Accio button until you reach the 30 point mark with the green collar. This is going to give you enough force to push out your opponent, but not too much so yours doesn't fall either. In some of the higher challenge variants with the obstacles, it's even easier as you can then just take them out in even more interesting ways. At number 5, while you're at Hogwarts, you will see quite a lot of characters and especially other students that will give you their own side quests to do. And while many of them are fetch quests, a few of them actually give you access to completely new areas. I would do each and every single one of them every time they pop up, especially that of Gareth Weasley who is the one you meet during Professor Sharp's potion class and you can help him get into trouble, but that's besides the point, he will eventually thank you for helping him and even give you another quest called Descending for Sweets. This will let you know a secret passage in Hogwarts that you can help make accessible again, which is also a nice hint to the books and the movies if you ever watch them. But it's a nice area that will remain accessible once you did complete this mission and it also brings you outside of Hogwarts more easily. Outside of Hogwarts, it's even more worth it to hit the quests in the smaller settlements. You can start with Arn's quest called Cart It Away right here in the lower Hogsfield, which is quite nice and quick to complete as it also gives access to a really awesome Silver Arrow Broom. This will cost 5000 gold, so I suggest preparing those if you want to buy it right away or maybe hold off this quest until later. The problem is that if you complete this quest right away, Arn will despawn after a few seconds as he teleports in a different location. So he doesn't come back to this one, not sure where he leaves off for, so that's why I recommend getting those 5000 Gs ready so that you can buy the really awesome broom right away from him. For the other areas around the map, I did not notice anything else despawning, so you're kinda in the clear with that, and I recommend also hitting up all of these other characters, as they will also open up as vendors around the towns. At number 6, another big mistake is trying to hold off from being evil, which in this game actually proves to be a lot more rewarding than not. Especially for those side quests, when you complete them, many times you have the choice of asking for an additional fee for your troubles. While this will get a less happy remark from many of the characters, they'll usually oblige and give you more money for your trouble without impacting any of your future progress. And in many of the cases, like for example in J. Pippin's side quest, if I were to choose the less friendly dialogue, he would give me 500 galleons. Meanwhile, if I chose the friendly route, he only gave me 300. But again, neither of these cases stopped me from accessing any of his shops. Other characters can even appreciate you for being a good negotiator, so it's always nice to explore that side as well. Meanwhile, at the school, many times if you help another student, you have the choice at the end to give or withhold the stuff that you help them with. And in some of these cases, the results can be a bit more nuanced, but they will still not influence anything major either. So for example, in the case of Zenobia's quest to bring back her gobstones, you have the option to withhold them or just give them back and encourage her to continue playing. Either of these will provide you the same rewards and XP at the end of this mission, but if you withhold them, you actually get to keep them in your inventory while she walks off mad at you. Meanwhile, if you give them back, I actually followed her and eventually she does go ahead, bring them up and plays around the courtyard area, which I found to be a nice detail. So maybe in the case of the students, sometimes the good option can be a little bit more interesting. Now, during many of these missions and other random exploration parts, pay close attention to these more intricate ornate treasure chests. These tend to look like the disillusionment ones, except they lack the eye that tracks you and you can open them right away. Every single one of these will guarantee a legendary unidentified gear piece and it's always going to be worth it to get them. You can also find these through maze puzzles, which you find by the way with their distinctive unique icon on the minimap as well as this green archway that you will see out in the wild. If you pass through it, this is going to reveal a quick maze that you have to navigate towards the middle of, 
which is going to hold that chest right there. And by the way, you can also find a few of these in some of the larger enemy camps, especially the ones that tend to be located around abandoned castles. So pay attention to them because it's worth it for the loot. And since we were talking about underground caves, there's quite a few sections in the game that require you to pass through some of these tiny gaps and small tunnels, which can be quite annoying as it can take forever to pass through them. So one way to make it much faster is to just use the swift upgrade for your dodge in the core talent line, which is going to make your character small enough to quickly pass through many of these gaps. You have to do it right before entering the gap so that you can start the animation, but usually it just lets you to instantly pass onto the other side. Or at the very least, if the tunnel is long enough, it can just slash off a significant part of it and you just have to walk a little bit of distance until you reach the other side. This brings us to number 9 if you're like me and love capturing a lot of creatures, that's actually quite a lucrative way of making a ton of money. Because any extra beast that you have, you can sell for 120 galleons at the brood and pack vendor back in Hogsmeade. This is a legit great way of making extra cash and you can even invest into a breeding pen to get additional specimens every half an hour or so and then sell them for a profit back at the shop. Speaking of profit, if you're in a dire need of moonstones needed to add your spellcrafts around the room of requirement, you can actually salvage many of the paintings and default decorations and then just place something else instead of them. There's even more you can find around mountain and underground areas, but this can help you a ton early on if you want a quick way to build something new. And finally, a quick one is to make sure that some of the money you made is invested into an automatic feeder. This is going to save you a ton of time, you just need to place it down and every time you visit your vivarium, your pets will already be taken care of with the food. The only thing you need to do more is to just bring up that brush and immediately collect the materials out of them if you want to do some crafting. And that's it, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video.